I was sitting with a bunch of friends and we're having this quite loud uh, argument about education. And we know that we simultaneously disagree passionately and are all really good friends. And I felt when I was in the U.S. that there was a feeling that, well, if we had that argument, then we couldn't be friends. We're back at the Empire's New Clothes. I'm your host, Brad from MacArthur. If you like what we're doing, just a reminder, please like, subscribe, rate, and review, share with your friends. It's the best way to help us do this every single week. And this week, we're speaking with Margaret Heffernan. She's a woman of many, many hats. For 13 years, she produced programs at the BBC. She was the CEO for five different major corporations. She's also a playwright. She's an author of six books. For this conversation, we dive into one of her books, Willful Blindness, Why We Ignore the Obvious at Our Peril. We overlay it into the context of America and Americans. It's a wide-ranging conversation, and I really hope you enjoy. Margaret, thank you so much for joining this morning. I'm looking forward to it, Brad. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So you've got many books you've written. Mm -hmm. Um, one in particular, I'd love to touch on willful blindness, though we can talk about a lot of them. You've got an incredible background and a bit of a journey that brought you here. Maybe, uh, explain a little bit about how'd you become interested in uh, writing to begin with? And then all these different topics that seem to have to do with power and these different dynamics in the workplace, but also just human nature and the, the greater world we live in. Sure. Well, I think for reasons I don't myself entirely understand, you know, I've spent a lot of my (laughs) life wondering why things are the way they are. I think some of that's probably attributable to the fact that um, I was born in Texas, but then when I was eight, I moved to the Netherlands. And I think that was quite a profound experience because certainly, you know, at that time, the two countries were very wildly different. And so it's a very early and profound experience of the degree to which you can do the same things in radically different ways. And indeed, people do do the same things in radically different Hmm. ways. And so I think it gave me a very early understanding that no one way is the right way. And a real interest in, well, what are the differences? And maybe the way I was brought up with isn't the right way, or maybe there's a better way to do things. So I guess it did, you know, what travel's supposed to do, which is kind of opened my mind. But it certainly left me with an abiding feeling that um, that there's always there's always room for contention, if you like, mm. and um, and that consensus doesn't necessarily. Uh, provide certainty. So I think that just left me with just a very open, very questioning mind. Um, And then I think I had a really great piece of luck. Well, I mean, I think moving to the Netherlands was a great piece of luck. But uh, the first job, well, (laughs) the first important job I had when I left the uh, university is I worked for a very, very brilliant radio producer named Piers Plowright. And Mm -hmm. Piers was obsessed with making greater and greater radio programs, which he did. And he was always too busy, so he gave me a huge scope to make programs of my own. And he worked the way he liked, which was wherever he wanted, whenever he wanted, so I did the same thing. And it was a very long time before I encountered a workplace or any institution where you had to turn up on time, you know, on set times and obey a lot of rules. I mean, it was, he gave me a huge amount of freedom with only, I think, the implicit instruction to do your best. And, um, and it was a long time before I realized, gee, not everywhere is like that. (laughs) So a lot of other places that I saw and a a lot of other industries I saw, I thought, wow, this is really a mess. Um, why is it this awful? And, you know, so I think I just was very lucky in the first half of my life to have a lot of experiences that I think made me a pretty persistent questioner of the status quo. Hmm. So you saw a bit of what it could be. Yeah. And then you experienced what it is in a lot of instances. 
Yeah. And you're I, like, why, why, why are we doing better? Why aren't we doing better? And why do people accept as gospel things which might not be true or which I could see weren't true? Um, I mean, I think also growing up in the Netherlands during the time of the Vietnam War and during the time of, you know, significant assassinations in the United States made me see very early on that the U.S. was a very, very troubled place. And, Mm -hmm. you know, this is also late 60s, you know, the civil rights movement. And I think it made me very uncertain of the greatness of the country, which when I was living there, everybody seemed to take for granted. And in many instances, I felt quite ashamed to be American, Um, ashamed by the assassinations, ashamed by the racism that was evident in the United States. And so I had what I think is a very useful experience, which was being on the outside. And I think Mm. that's where I'm generally most comfortable. Interesting. You know, I actually had a similar-ish experience. So I grew up in Georgia. um, And when I was 18, I I left, um, was in Montana and all over, and then did a bunch of traveling for... uh, I was obsessed with whitewater kayaking, actually, at the time. <laughs> so I just traveled the world kayaking. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, and, and um, you know, at that time, I, and growing up, there was a sense of shame for me as well, of like coming from the South where there's some uh, very deep racism. Uh, and then I was uh, embarrassed to be American when I was abroad. But then as I grew older and the more that I came back to the U.S., um, being gone for long stretches, I began to realize there's there's some really wonderful things uh, with the U.S. and actually people yeah. abroad. Um, some some you know it's it's a very mixed bag, but some people really appreciate Americans and yeah. and I began as I grew older to understand a little more that you know what that there's not this black and white this like yeah it's it's more nuanced there's more to it than that and. And it sounds like kind of similar to yourself. It was a bit of this this experience and this journey as you were older and you learn more about yourself and where you come from. And you can't change where you come from. Right. Um, and so now I'm, I'm more proud to be American, but in a different way. And I don't think I would could have understood that when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but so, you know, a theme that I noticed in uh, some of the talks you give and some of the books you've written it seems to be there's a lot of thought um, put into power and power mm-hmm. dynamics mm-hmm. and also this idea of untapped power for change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why do you think you have zeroed in on this so much? Mm-hmm. That's a really good question. I think, um, I think there are lots of reasons. I think that, when I was growing up, my father worked for Exxon. And I think, you know, by external standards, he was very successful. But I think he hated it for a lot of the time. I don't think he Mm. knew he hated it. He came from a very poor background. (laughs) He was very grateful for a career that, you know, put him in a place Mm -hmm. of um, very significant economic security. Um, but it definitely didn't make him a nicer person, the work, the work that he was doing. Mm-hmm. And um, and I think that made me very skeptical or very probably very uncomfortable, actually, about the power that this huge company seemed to have over my father's life. I mean, first of all, it had moved us to Holland. And secondly, mm-hmm. you know, it, it wanted to move us to Australia, and I grew up in an expatriate community of many, many people working for companies like that, you know, who were sent somewhere different every two years. So I had a very personal experience of the power that such huge companies have over people's lives. Um, and as an employee, I had a very, you know, probably not exceptional experience of, as an employee of, you know, how you can, as I was lucky to, have a really fantastic boss. 
but then you can have exceptionally terrible bosses, you know. And wow, it does that change the way you feel about yourself and about your life. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll never forget when I was running my first tech company in the United States when I moved back. Um, you know, discovering that you can buy and sell companies. And what that really means is you're buying and selling the people. I mean, yes, you're buying and selling intellectual property and assets and so on. But but really, it's people and thinking, whoa, that's a pretty uncomfortable idea. <laughs> I thought that kind of went out with slavery. Um, <laughs> and then as a boss myself, I think I've always been very alert to the huge impact you have on the lives of the people who work for you. And that isn't a matter of choice. You have it. By dint of being their employer, you have got that power, whether you want it or not. And I had this really extraordinary, I think extraordinary experience of watching a lot of people around me becoming very, very successful and very rich. Um, I saw them read this success as a kind of anointing of their genius. So they became very convinced that their success meant they were kind of special people who could get away with, you know, some pretty poor behavior. Um, And I just became very uncomfortable with the fact that as an employer, I could have so much power over how the people who worked with me felt about themselves, about the hours they worked, about um, all kinds of things. So, and, and I watched a lot of a lot of my peers and colleagues um, really becoming quite hardened, quite mechanical in their way of treating people. Often, you know, I remember when I was still an employee and a member of a senior leadership team, you know, having to go off with my peers to a nearby hotel to figure out the layoffs that we were going to do. Hmm. And, I mean, clearly I could and could do these things and did do these things, but I was really attentive to what they did to people. And I felt, and, you know, I've written, as you say, extensively on this subject of the degree to which I think power allows people to dehumanize others. I think it places a huge distance, psychological and sometimes physical, between those with power and those who haven't got it. A distance, you know, I feel if I'm sitting in, uh, first class, right? And there are lots of people behind me having a much less nice time. Um, and I felt that the more power I had, the bigger the risk was that I got more and more out of touch. Because I certainly, I mean, I'm sure it happened to me. I definitely saw it happen to my colleagues. Um there's this wonderful story of Richard Fold, who used to run Lehman Brothers. You know, his his journey to work was a chauffeur-driven car to the heliport, a private helicopter to Manhattan, another chauffeur-driven car to his offices, and a private elevator into his office, which meant at no point did he come into contact with anybody except yeah. drivers. And thinking, well, wow, in that existence, you are so cut off from the real world. How is it you're allowed to make decisions that impact the lives of millions of people? So I just, I mean, it's, of course, a complete truism that power corrupts. But I haven't read very much about how it does that. And I became interested partly because it's interesting. Power is interesting. You only have to look at the millions of people who love watching Succession to see that power is interesting. But I became really interested in, you know, how does it get to you? Where and when do you cross the line? 
um, and and very very guarded in trying to protect myself from it. So I'm hearing it almost felt like a responsibility when you had these positions, a responsibility to take care of these folks because irregardless of if you wanted to or not, you're impacting them in a great way. Was that was that a burden or was it more a mix of an opportunity, but there's some fear there? What What was that like? Well, I think it's both. It's a wonderful question, by the way, which I don't think anybody's ever asked me. It was an opportunity because I felt I had the opportunity to give people a really great experience at work of the kind that I'd had. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I'm most proud of is how many people who worked for me who went on to set up companies of their own and to have had really wonderful careers doing that. Um, And I'm, you know, I take deep pride in what they say they learned working with me. Um, Mm -hmm. But was it a burden? It absolutely was. Yes. Um, And it, I like to think it didn't stop me from making some hard calls, but it was definitely a burden. And I think personally that anybody who has to do layoffs or anybody who has to fire people, if they don't find that painful, then they have really crossed a line and should get out now, right? Something very bad has happened to them. It ought to be painful, this stuff. Um, I don't think, I don't think it's, it's responsible or moral to be able to tell somebody that you're taking their job away from them and not feel something. Now, I didn't find mm-hmm. it incapacitating, obviously, but I think, I don't think anybody should enjoy it. And when you're, it feels like a real core part of a lot of your thinking here is that uh, power can corrupt. Yeah. How how does it? Oh, you, what you said earlier, something along the lines of, um, uh, and you'll say it better than me, something along the lines of, um, with power you can begin to dehumanize those around you or mm. under you or th- those that are within your power. Right. Can you walk me through a bit of your thinking of that process, someone coming into that position, being uh, given all this power or taking it, Mm -hmm. and then that process, that internal process that happens inside of them where they begin to dehumanize those? What are the mechanics of that? Yeah. Well, I think it's certainly the easiest way that it happens is, you know, you rise through the ranks and suddenly you find you're responsible for hundreds of people maybe thousands of people, quite a lot of them, you may not know their name. Um, Mm -hmm. Even if you know their names, you know very little about them. So now they are living beings over whom you have power, but you know nothing about them. So they become like things. Um, So that, and that happens automatically with scale. Right. Lots mm-hmm. of business thinkers and writers are obsessed with scale, just got to scale up. Um, that is an unavoidable byproduct of scale, which is people become things. So that just is intrinsically dehumanizing. Now, if you put around that a sort of superstructure of uh, bureaucracy, job descriptions, goals, targets, KPIs, etc., Essentially, what you're doing is you're treating the company or the organization somewhat like a machine and everybody's playing their part in the machine. But the more you um, you bureaucratize it for efficiency, the less flexible it becomes, the less flexible the people become, and the less attention you pay to who are they and what do they care about? And what happens then is that as you start treating people like things, lo and behold, they start acting like things, you know, they behave, they follow the rules. Mm. Um, they become a little bit, often a little bit robotic. They are highly incentivized often to do exactly what they're told. 
which may mean that the perfectly obvious thing that they should do because they haven't been told, they don't do. So a classic example of this is, um, you know, in the explosion of the subprime mar uh, mortgage market before the financial crash, you had lots and lots and lots of people who were told, you know, sell this many mortgages, at, you know, per week or whatever. And if you achieve that goal, you get a big cash bonus. And if you don't achieve that goal, you get given a cabbage. This is a true story. So you get humiliation, <laughs> you get money. Um, and both of those categories of people knew that they were selling mortgages to people who could not afford them because they wanted to get the cash or they very much did not want to get the humiliation of being handed a cabbage at the end of the week. They all knew what they were doing was wrong. But they also, nowhere in their job description did it say, if you feel you're doing something that's ethically wrong, please tell us and here's how. So the system dehumanizes people. Bureaucracies hmm. dehumanize people in the interest of efficiency. And I think, you know, and this may feel like a rather alarmist comparison, but I think I first started thinking about this as I watched my father, you know, live inside this gigantic corporation that certainly appeared not to care about him. And I saw it making him, I would say, less and less human. And, you know, we were living in the Netherlands at a time when the end of the Second World War didn't feel that long ago. And everybody knew that the Nazis were experts in dehumanization on an epic scale. And I didn't see very much difference between the way in which my father was being treated and the way in which people in concentration camps were being treated. Now, that's an extravagant comparison of a kind that a nine-year-old might make, right? It just felt the same. And I'm not saying, of course, you know, that Exxon was a genocidal company, but it felt to me that all the processes were the same and that the people responsible for carrying them out were being managed in a way to ensure that they felt preferably nothing and certainly no responsibility. And... And so I'm I'm extremely wary of scale as an uh, you know an unequivocal good. Um, of course, the climate crisis has made me even more skeptical of scale as an unequivocal good. And I'm also very conscious to get this down to a slightly more mundane level. That at the very least, what happens when you put all these rules and regs and bureaucracies in place is you absolutely constrain what people are thinking about. So if you have a lot to do and some very ambitious goals and targets, um, you're going to think about that and focus on it intensely. And the consequence is going to be there's all sorts of other stuff you're not going to think about. And so I regularly have companies phone me up and essentially say, Margaret, can you help us make our people more creative? Because now we need to innovate. <laughs> you don't seem to have very many ideas, right? And my first question to them always is now, well, let's look at what you're doing to stop them. Because my hunch is, before we start thinking about how to get them to try to be more creative, what we need to think about is, what are all the impediments to their creativity that we need to get out of the way? And it might be that just getting them out of the way is enough. Interesting. So that really makes me think about well, that that kind of just naturally connects it to these ideas of willful blindness mm -hmm. that you yeah. you write about and, and think about. So maybe let's go there a little bit. Um, for starters, it's a legal term. So maybe yeah. explain what it means in a legal context, and then also just kind of the, the general concept that you've spent a lot of time thinking about. Sure. So you're quite right. Willful blindness is a legal term, and it um, I first encountered it 
when I was reading a transcript of the trial of uh, Jeff Skilling and Ken Lay, the CEO and chairman of Enron. And what the law says is that if there's information that you could have had and should have had and somehow managed not to have, the law deems that you've been willfully blind because you had an opportunity for knowledge, but you shirked it. And I remain, I remember reading that and kind of a chill going down my spine thinking, yikes, this is a very high standard. And I'm sure there have been times in my own career where there are things I should have known and could have known and didn't. But then, you know, what I started thinking about is obviously I was already thinking about Enron. I started thinking about things like child abuse in the Catholic Church in Ireland. I started thinking about Nazi war crimes and the degree to which, you know, the West itself during the Second World War had turned a blind eye to those things. And I suddenly thought, yikes, this stuff's everywhere, right? And yeah. um, and that was really the point at which I started to, to research my book because I thought, okay, so if it's everywhere, this is a thing, it's an important thing, how does this happen? And I think I had a slightly naive or romantic idea that if we understood the mechanisms by which it happened, perhaps we'd be in a better position to prevent it. So I'm, I'm guessing you, you don't believe that anymore. Well, I think we can minimize it. Yeah. I mean, I'm still, mm. I'm still a romantic, right? Um, <laughs> well, that's good. You don't want to lose that. No, exactly. And I'm still, though it may not sound it, you know, I'm still really pretty much an optimist. Um, mm -hmm. I think there are certain kinds of environments um, where it's much more likely willful blindness will flourish. And I think there are certain kinds of environments where it's much less likely it will flourish. Um, I think it's less likely in smaller businesses. I think it's more likely in very large businesses, in very competitive environments, in environments that are highly bureaucratized, um, even to the point of being automated. Um, so, But I do think that actually in most organizations, most people know what's going on. And I've seen this time and time and time again, where you get a, a, a scandal in a company and it may be, you know, Wells Fargo mis-selling or Volkswagen emissions. And the narrative when these stories break is always the same. First of all, oh, my goodness, how could that possibly happen? Nobody knew. Then it turns out, oh, well, actually, somebody knew. And then it turns out, actually, quite a lot of people knew. And then it turns out, actually, just about everybody knew. <laughs> um, yeah. And so then the issue is, okay, if, if so many people know, then how do we create an environment in which it's much easier for somebody to put their hand up and say, this is a problem and we have to do something about it. And a lot of my working life, I spend working with companies and individuals on exactly that problem. How do we create an environment in which it's safe to do that, where people are well enough trained to know how to do it safely, not to just do it all by themselves, and how do you train leaders to understand that when people come to them with concerns, this should not label them as a troublemaker. It should really mm -hmm. make you sit up and listen and pay attention. Because most people who start off as whistleblowers um, don't mean harm. They tend to be your most loyal, dedicated employees, and they're worried. And they may be right to be worried, in which case you would do well to take them seriously. So this concept of willful blindness deep down, is it as simple as preferentiating short-term gain over long-term pain, something like that? Or is it, is it much more nuanced and deeper than that? I think it's a lot more nuanced and deep than that. I think, for example, mm -hmm. um, You know, so there, there are many for, there are many different sources of willful blindness. One is if you have a company or an organization where, by and large, everybody pretty much thinks the same way, comes from a similar kind of background, cares about the same stuff, you can be pretty sure 
they're all going to see the same stuff. Well, if they see the same stuff, they're not going to see other things. So at the very least, you're going to miss something. So this is one of the big arguments for diversity, which is different kinds of people see different things. Mm -hmm. uh, and the more you hire in your own image, the more likely it is that you're going to be blindsided. And this is one of the many reasons why I think um, the company BP got into so many problems and had so many catastrophic uh, industrial accidents, which is they had lots of people who thought the same way, acted the same way, and didn't want to rock the boat. They also, as it happened, had a phenomenally complex organizational structure that meant half the time they not only did they not know the people working for them, they'd never even been to the places where they were working. So mm -hmm. you had a lot of structural blindness. You had a lot of physical blindness. You had, you know, plants in uh, Texas and all over, the, all over the world being run from a very, very tony, leafy square in the richest part of London. You know, the, the cultural gulf in itself was gigantic. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure anybody in that organization could have known what was going on unless they really took it upon themselves to try to get to know every single site they managed, which might have been impossible. Um, yeah. I think, you know, and, and of course, the way that we typically deal with scale is we come up with models. That's how we model economies, right? It's how we model gigantic corporations. But the prob problem with models is that they always leave something out. And uh, the, you know, the, the economist Paul Krugman is very brilliant on this subject. Many people have commented on the beauty of his economic models, but he's a little wary, quite rightly, you know, saying that he sometimes thinks that what gets left out of his models might be more important than what gets let, put in. So he's very alert to the fact that a model has to leave a lot out. Otherwise, it would be as big as reality itself, right? So it'd serve no purpose. So, you know, whether you're running a country or a company, you're working for models which work for a while sometimes, but as things change... They may stop working, but how will you know? So all of those kind of structural issues means that unless you are surrounded by people who are really well-informed, well-trained, and fierce in their determination to articulate what reality is, if you're in a leadership position, there's going to be a ton of stuff you simply do not know. And the bigger mm -hmm. problem comes, of course, when you don't even know you don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I'd like to bring this a little bit to focus in on America mm -hmm. uh, with these concepts and ideas we've been building up. And kind of to start, I'd, I'd just like to ask, in your opinion, what areas do you believe Americans or the American nation is most willfully blind at the moment? Mm. I mean, it's a bit of a contest, right? <laughs> and, yeah. um, and I'm not saying that other countries don't have the same problems. Many do. Yeah, um, of course. I think America's blindness to the climate crisis is pretty jaw-dropping. Um, mm. And we notice it more, sadly, because, of course, America is in a stronger position than any com country except probably China to make a huge positive impact, which it's not making. And there are, you know, there are millions of alibis as to why this is the case. Um, but, but it could be doing so very, very much more. It has the wealth, it has the intelligence, it has the technology. Um, but it's, I mean, it's for 30 years we've known about this. Much of the finest research is American research done by American uh, scientists, paid for by American tax dollars. And um, 
and we've got very, very little done. And the time we've wasted is going to cost all of us dearly. So, I mean, there's a long list I could give you, but that seems to me the most obvious and the most urgent. And what are the, the mechanics of that? Is it is it a cultural? Because when you speak about willful blindness in corporations and industry, I I'm hearing a big element of culture. There's this culture. There's these incentivized structures mm -hmm. to you're incentivized to be willfully blind. And then if we're looking at a political structure and a nation where there are lots of people that are concerned about that, but then some aren't. Mm -hmm. How does that? How does that kind of work out? It feels much more complex than yeah. than uh, a corporation. It is. It is, and it isn't. It, the same principles are absolutely at work. To the same degree that a corporation is rewarded for short term gains, um, the political system in the United States is heavily weighted towards short term outcomes. Um, two years. I don't know what you mean. Well, I mean, yeah. if, you know, if a, if a politician wants to have a long career they're, and they're going to be, yeah. you know, they or their party is up for re-election every two years, um, a long-term planning is not going to be their strength. And it's the rare politician, it does happen, but it's the rare politician who's prepared to use what political capital they might have for something that isn't going to deliver very short-term gratification for the voters. Mm -hmm. So, and I mean, that's exactly the same, you know, where I live here in the UK, you know, the political cycle does not reward long-term thinking. So part of it is that, right? Part of it is, um, and we've seen this in the pandemic also, uh, the political system isn't exactly jam-packed full of scientists who understand complex problems. Um, I would say the United States... Um, and I'm, you know, I'm a huge fan of, of the United States. I'm a citizen of the United States. I pay my taxes, you know, and there's much that I love about it. Um, but it is absolutely addicted to consumption. People don't like changing habits. So getting habits to change is difficult. There is a gigantic system of selling in the United States, which um, is now so subtle and so endemic in every single thing that people do in every place they go, um, that it's hard to resist the gravitational pull to consumption. Um, I think, you know, I think there's a great deal in American culture which fundamentally does believe bigger is better, right? Bigger houses, bigger cars, bigger companies, bigger streets, bigger parks, you know, uh, a bigger country. Uh, so I think there's, there's a lot structurally and culturally that makes climate change the ultimate nightmare problem. I think also, um, you know, when I wrote about climate change and willful blindness, I think, you know, you can, some of it's pretty simple. If you live surrounded by people who don't really care about the climate, then you don't feel particularly comfortable haranguing them about it. You may stop caring, you know, how big your car is. You may not be quite so embarrassed anymore at the size of products you buy or the amount of food waste that you produce. Um, so you're going to fit in with the people that you're around. Um, you're going to have a mental model of success, which is about getting more, having more, right? Um, and you're going to con conform to the no social norms that you see around you. And if you see nobody really particularly perturbed by the climate crisis, you may think, well, A, I don't want to be the outsider that cries wolf, and B, well, if they're not concerned, should I be? And so one gets kind of lulled into passivity because, hey, if everybody else is passive, well, why shouldn't I be? So 
I kind of wanted to step it down to the different um, political parties mm-hmm. and and get your opinion on where is the left and the right willfully blind. But I feel like we kind of covered where's the right willful, willfully blind by talking about climate change. If you got something else, you can throw it out there. But what I'd love to hear is, in your opinion, where is the left willfully blind currently? Well, I think the left, I mean, it depends what you mean by the left, right? Um I mean, I would say that the Democrats have been willfully blind to inequality for a long time. And mm-hmm. I've, I mean, I, I feel this particularly in the sense that um, I think that the Democrats became very absorbed in courting the rich, having these great kind of war, uh, war chests, they became very dominated by fundraising. Um, and they absolutely forgot about the poor. And in forgetting about the poor, they also forgot about minorities. And they also forgot about women. That's a whole lot of people to forget about. It's a whole lot. <laughs> it's a whole lot. And it's interesting. I remember my my... My son, who is also American and went to university in America, uh, and we were back there this summer, turned to me at one point and he said, you know, the thing about America, it just seems to have a failure to learn. (laughs) He said, you know, how can it be as we come out of this pandemic that nobody is saying what's so blindingly obvious, which is the country needs a national health service. How can it be that we came out of civil rights and then kind of forgot about it? Why did we not learn from the civil rights movement and the anguish that that entailed? Why is it that, you know, that every time um, a black man is shot by a policeman, everybody acts like it's never happened before? Why is it Americans haven't learned that actually arming everybody to the teeth is a really seriously bad idea? And I think that, you know, the left has been very focused on, I mean, in the Democratic Party, very focused on, well, let's get elected and then dot, 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 without really engaging with what might have been their bedrock of support and hugely distracted by the notion that, well, if you really slice and dice your data with minute care, you can find everybody who doesn't want the other guys and getting them to vote for you will just about be enough. So mm-hmm. I think getting overly embroiled in the minutiae of election politics as opposed to politics has left the Democrats uh, looking very thin. And as for the left in America, well, I'd be very hard pressed. And I feel particularly because I haven't lived there for um, some time now, I'd be very hard to pr- uh, hard pressed to say where the left is. I can say from the reading that I've done and you know the talks I have with my American friends that identity pro- uh, politics has sort of diverted focus on the fundamental economic inequalities in the United States. Um, And without some greater economic equality, other kinds of identity equality just isn't possible. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an interesting observation your son made in that the U.S. is a failure to learn. And to open up that a little more, I feel like probably a lot of people, I know I do, um, are like this, but it feels like America doesn't enjoy critique uh, especially from outsiders, but then either, either from Americans, I think there's this sense of pride. And I would even speak to someone who's listening and saying, well, I critique America a lot. I, I think there's a lot of wrong with it. I would say, okay, what if I was to critique your platform, your point of view, the things you dearly believe that um. should be the way America is? I think that person would take that critique quite poorly and they wouldn't really uh, absorb any of that into their thinking. And I don't know exactly where that comes from. Perhaps this place of pride where it's, it's like, I'm proud of 
these uh, perhaps identity politics or uh let's say championing uh, an open and free market and being very against any kind of regulations mm-hmm. for anything yeah whatever the platform may be there's a sense of pride that I'm American, and this is the way that I believe the true America should be. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a very. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting insight, and I I think you're right. I think, um, I think Americans want to be proud of their country, and there's much to be proud of. But what I think I hear you saying is that there's a deep reluctance to admit that you can be proud of something and critical at the same time. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I really remember um, when I was still living in, in Boston is it was at the time of the Monica Lewinsky scandal. And I remember, and, and Clinton's impeachment. And I remember thinking, isn't this incredible? Um, there's this thing going on. It's a big deal. Nobody in the company is talking about it. Now, if I were running my UK company, if I had been running my UK company at the time, I guarantee you everybody would be talking about it. They wouldn't necessarily yeah. agree. I mean, they definitely wouldn't all agree, right? But everybody would be talking about it. And I thought, wow, this is really different. And then when I moved back to the UK and I was a couple of nights after I'd come back and I was sitting with a bunch of friends and we're having this quite loud uh, argument about education. And I remember sitting there and thinking, oh, isn't this fantastic? We're having a good old hammer and tongs argument. And we know that we (laughs) simultaneously disagree passionately and are all really good friends. And I felt when I was in the U.S. that there was a feeling that, well, if we had that argument, then we couldn't be friends. And so Mm. I'd rather not have the argument. And I think that's deeply damaging and unfortunate. And also, it happens not to be true. And I made a program about this for the BBC recently, about um, what I think of as positive disagreement. And there's been this sort of theory out there, promulgated a little bit by Cass Sunstein, that, well, there's no point arguing with people because they'll never change their minds. And I remember reading his book on this topic, and it really sort of made me think. And I thought, hang on a second. If nobody ever changed their minds, we'd still be living in caves. This is ridiculous. People do change their minds. And I started having conversations with people about, you know, on what topics have you changed your minds? You know, and it wasn't just the kind of tired old thing that, well, you know, in my youth I was a communist, you know, and now I'm right wing. It was all sorts of things where people had changed their minds about religion, about drink driving, about seatbelts, about um, at what age you should vote, I mean, about gay marriage. I mean, big things, little things, things all over the place. And one of the really outstanding academics on this topic, a, a guy named James Fishkin, has done a lot in the area of deliberative democracy in terms of bringing together people um, from very opposite you know, perspectives and getting them to spend time together. together. And... And people do change each other's minds. What they don't do is change their minds right in front of you, right? And it comes to vault fast. But when a conversation stops, the conversation doesn't stop. People go on thinking about it. And now they're thinking about something different. And as you think about something different, you start to see different things. You start to see maybe evidence for the other person's argument. And it may be a day, a week, a month, a year, 10 years. And maybe the evidence on the other side is mounted so much that actually now you do believe something different, which has clearly happened in the minds of billions of people worldwide with regard to gay marriage. So um, so I think this idea that, well, we can't have the argument is possibly one of the most dangerous things I've seen in American culture. 
And it goes hand in hand with what I think of as tremendous American generosity, hospitality, and politeness. Americans are some of the most sincerely polite people I know on earth. But it has a downside, which is this unwillingness to say, could we have an argument and stay friends? Mm -hmm. I think that's incredibly well put. And I, I agree so much with that. And I, you know, for me, when I think about why can't we have those discussions and Americans aren't alone. I, I've been living in Canada for the last number of years and I would say Canadians are even more extreme. <laughs> they, they don't want to have uncomfortable conversations generally. This doesn't mean all Canadians. But, and I think about, is that a transition? Have, have groups, people say Americans always been like that? I don't know. But, but when I think about why can't we have those conversations, perhaps it's partly because of identity, because of, I've rooted my identity in my beliefs of, say, about any of these topics we've discussed as examples, mm. then having an argument where I could be wrong or I could be challenged is to have the very core of who I am challenged and mm. kind of battered around. And yeah. that's, that's something we don't all want to do on the, on the, on a, on the regular. Mm. That, that, is, that is, very, is a very scary thing. It's, it's a very... Um, open thing you want to do with someone very close to you who you feel comfortable with. And so I wonder if that's a part of it because we've rooted our identity in these beliefs. We've, we've moralized these stances, which mm. some people could say are trivial. Some would say are very important. And so I just kind of wonder how that might play in all that. Yeah. I mean, I guess I tend to think identity isn't can't be, shouldn't be that static. I mean, that is a failure to learn and to grow. Um, and I, I, I mean, I absolutely recognize what, you know, the phenomenon that you're describing. But um, first of all, humans change till the moment they die. Our brains change till the moment we die. So the Thank goodness. idea that, that our thinking shouldn't change is extremely frightening. In addition, of course, I don't have just one identity, right? I'm a writer. I'm an academic. I'm a playwright. I'm a mother. I'm a daughter. I'm a sister. I'm a wife. I'm a neighbor. I'm a parish counselor. Um... I'm all these things. I'm a citizen. I'm a consumer. I mean, it, the idea that a person is one thing, that's the, that's the thinking of totalitarianism. So if you're mm. right about that, that's very frightening. I mean, this is, you know, to take the heat down a little bit. That's why I'm <laughs> so, so dismissive and dismayed by, you know, these psychographic tests like um, Myers-Briggs. I mean, it isn't just that the science is terrible because they're not statistically valid, but it, that, it incur that these things encourage people to think of themselves as one type. And as, you know, Theodore Adorno said in the 50s, when these things were becoming kind of cool, dividing people into types is a first step down a very, very ugly road. So I think we're all a lot better coming to understand that, that we are all, we all have the capacity to grow, evolve, and change, and we are not rigid until we're dead. And speaking for myself personally, I don't want to be dead for you know for quite a long time yet. So the <laughs> fluidity of what I can think about and the options I can consider, I will defend fiercely for as long as I'm able. Well, Margaret, I think 
That's a great place to wrap it up. You've been super generous with your time, and uh, I love the direction this conversation has taken. I didn't even know we'd be end up talking about all this stuff. It's been, I'm sure we could do this for another hour or two, but uh, we got to let you go. So if folks want to find more of your work and the things you do, first off, I didn't know you're a playwright, um, so maybe where where is the play uh, showing at the moment? But where can folks find more of your work if they want to dive in deeper? Uh, these the topics? easiest thing is just to go to my website, which is www.mheffernan.com. Okay, perfect. Um, we'll send people over that way. So, again, thank you so much. I, I certainly appreciate your time. Super. Well, thanks for your excellent questions and your excellent observations. Take care. Thank you for watching to the very end. If you like our content, make sure to like, subscribe, rate, and review. It is the best way to help us reach the most people possible. And that way we can keep producing content every week. Make sure to drop a comment below of who you'd like us to interview next. And we look forward to seeing you next week. 